Good afternoon, and welcome to the Ford School. Uh, I'm Susan Collins, the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean here, and it's really a pleasure to see so many of you joining us this afternoon for a discussion of a very important topic. So on behalf of the Ford School, I'd like to welcome you to another in the Ford School series of distinguished lectures, Policy Talks at the Ford School. We're very honored today to be joined by the Honorable Margaret Spellings, former U.S. Secretary of Education and currently President and CEO of a D.C.-based public policy consulting firm. Ms. Spellings' complete biography is in your program, and I encourage you to read more about her very extensive background um, informing and crafting education policy at all levels, from the local school board to the White House. She, of course, was one of the chief architects of the No Child Left Behind, uh, perhaps the most ambitious and far-reaching public uh, education policy initiative of the past 40 years. And we could not be more pleased to host her today as she reflects on what we've learned in the past 10 years as the legislation was passed and um, where we might be going forward. Today's lecture is hosted by the Center for Local, State, and Urban Policies uh, Education Policy Initiative. And I'd like to thank my colleague, Brian Jacob, for his hard work and his leadership, both of Close Up and EPI. The lecture is co-sponsored as well by the Nonprofit and Public Management Center, by the University of Michigan School of Education, and uh, Dean Deborah Ball will be joining us shortly. Um, we appreciate collaboration and partnership on, uh, on this lecture. I'd also like to welcome Regent Julia Darlow, we are delighted to have you with us. Thank you for joining us here today. Um, I believe that State Representative Rick Olson is also with us, and we are very pleased that um, he uh, will hopefully be joining us later, so perhaps he's not with us yet. <laughs> um, he represents the 55th District, which includes Saline and uh, other areas within Washtenaw County and Monroe County. So we're very pleased that he will be joining us uh, later today. So with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you the Honorable Margaret Spellings. Thank you, Dean. Thank you very much, and thank you for being here this afternoon um, on this blustery Michigan uh, Monday. So uh, as, as Susan said, I've been involved in education policy for, for a good while now, longer than I probably care to admit. And what I love about it, and for those of you who are, who are thinking about careers in public policy, uh, it's, a, it's a great one because everybody's an expert. Everybody has an opinion about school. You've been to school. You're, you have kids in school. And it's, a very, uh, it's very much something that, that is, is, you know, consumers feel like they have expertise on, which is the beauty and the bane of it. Um, I have had the opportunity to work on behalf of local school boards around the state legislature for a couple of governors, one of whom became the President of the United States, and I'll get into some of that. Um, and what I want to do today is, is talk about uh, No Child Left Behind and federal policy and, and this kind of great uh, audacious goal that we set about 10 years ago to really leave no child behind. And so I hope you'll come away convinced because I'm sure some of you, some of you I know, uh, are skeptics. So we'll see if this actually will work because I'm very technology challenged, let me just say that. Um, so. I, you know, it's, it's, I won't take too much time on this, but I think it's good to start with, you know, how we got here, just briefly. And I know some of you all know this because you're studying education policy, so pardon me for those of you who are already experts beyond the expertise that you have as a user. So the federal role in education, and this is what's going on in Washington now, and we constantly relitigate and reframe, you know, what set of grown-ups ought to decide things, ought to make policy on behalf of children. And the Federal Department of Education really was established as part of the, the whole civil rights movement in the mid-60s. Prior to that, it had been a department within uh, HEW, Health, Education, and Welfare. And Jimmy Carter made a, a, a commitment to the teacher unions that if he was elected, he would create a freestanding department. Well, he wasn't elected, uh, but the department got created in any event, or he, his first secretary served only a brief period of time, and then he uh, left office. But it, what the whole idea of a federal role was to level the playing field. We had been through a period as, as part of our civil rights uh, debates 
that it was presumed uh, that states really couldn't be trusted to see about the needs of every single child and that Title I and these big federal programs were really derived and designed to make sure that you know, they were to, to set up to level the playing field, to, to provide some commitments, whether they were special ed kids or poor or minority kids, that that, that was a federal imperative. I love this quote uh, from Senator Robert Kennedy when this all was going on uh, in the mid-60s about a, what was a kind of a precursor to accountability, and that is that he said, I want to change this bill because it doesn't have any way of measuring those damned educators, and we really ought to have some kind of evaluation. Am I standing in the way of that thing? Um, some evaluation there and some measurement of whether any good is happening. So that was a little bit of a, there's the gentleman that's standing in front of the thing. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so it was, a, it was a, a civil rights imperative in the early days. Then came, you know, fast forward to the, to the mid-80s or so, a nation at risk. That's going to be 30 years next year, uh, 30 years ago, amazingly so. And it was a real wake-up call to our country. You know, we had sort of thought that education was fine and dandy, no problem, didn't really think about it. But what we learned in that, uh, that report was that we were doing a pretty sorry job, especially with respect to poor and minority kids. And what that uh, netted was a lot of activity in the states, a lot of governors, uh, the president, uh, President H.W. Bush convened a summit. Bill Clinton was the head of the National Governors Association at, at the time. There was a lot of activity going on in states around standards and accountability and sort of the precursors to what would become No Child Left Behind. Uh, we also saw a lot of educational entrepreneurship. This is when the charter school mo movement started to, to be discussed. Teach for America, Troops to Teachers, some of these more innovative things uh, that were a little bit one-off at the time, the choice measures, Milwaukee, so on, were starting to take hold. So uh, then came No Child Left Behind, and we went from this idea of a thousand flowers blooming, lots of states doing their own things, a little entrepreneurial, this and that, to something that was more national in nature. And when President Bush, I, I was working for him at the time in, in the great Lone Star State, um, we, he ran as a so-called compassionate conservative. And if you were a Republican in, in those days, you were against the Department of Education. He was the first real federal candidate that started talking about a federal role. Uh, most of the orthodoxy in the Reagan era and so forth was to abolish the Department of Education, to return uh, education policy making completely to the states, et cetera. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But if you were, if, if education was your number one issue in, uh, in uh, 96, you voted for Clinton over Dole uh, by 62 points. I mean, if you cared about education, you voted for Bill Clinton, period. When Bush was elected, he and Gore were about the same. And Bush talked a lot about education on the campaign trail. And he had the luxury, I would say at the time, to talk about federal investments and to talk about revenues and so forth. So, what we saw was uh, a lot of, um, a, of interesting bedfellows, some strange political coalitions that began to develop between the civil rights community and the business community in, in favor of a more vigorous federal role and more accountability, opposed by sort of the, what I'll call federalist Republicans, old style, you no know, federal role kind of Republicans, and the teachers unions. And it's been a really interesting uh, journey. Okay, so what is No Child Left Behind? I know you've read a lot about it in the paper. People talk about it. Um, but, the, but I want to take a moment, since you have to listen to me for a few minutes, to talk about what the policy really does say. And No Child Left Behind really is more than a slogan. It actually describes what it is that we're trying to do in the law. What it says is that we really mean to, we really aim to educate every single child, P.S., virtually every single child, and we'll talk about some of the exceptions to that, and rightfully so, over a period of time, in this case 2014, to state-established grade-level proficiency, whatever that means, as described and determined by the states. We know that states pay about 91 cents of every dollar 
for the provision of education, and it's a very small investment uh, that comes from, from, the, from the federal government. We're going to do this, we say, in No Child Left Behind, by finding out where every child is in these two gateway subject areas of reading and math. Uh, we're going to test every kid annually, and we're going to disaggregate or separate the data by student group so that we know how the, all the Hispanic students are doing in a particular campus and district, how the African American students are doing, special ed, and on and on. And so it's, it's a, a pretty simple notion, very profound, powerful, but really hard to do because we are and were woefully short of doing those things. So when I, when I talk about the all students on grade level by 2014 with reasonable exceptions, I think this is one of the things that is most misunderstood about, about the law. It's as if, you know, we're trying to expect people who are profoundly or severely handicapped, you know, to, to expecting them to achieve at high uh, grade level standards. That's not the case. On any given day in any state in this country, you know, many, many children are out of the accountability system because they're transitioning to English, they are profoundly disabled, they, uh, there aren't enough of a, of a set of kids, Hispanic, special ed, or otherwise, to be congregated on a campus to have reliability for accountability purposes. So there's a lot of reasons that some number of children are out of the accountability system. And I think our question is, you know, are those remaining the folks that we ought to, the children we ought to be worried about getting to grade level by 2014? I often say to, to parents when I address campuses and the like, you know, when do you want your kid on grade level? As for me, I want my children working on grade level when they're in the grade that, that, that they're attending. And I think, you know, we have, if somebody walked into your, your family and said, we think we can get your grandchild, Mr. School Board Member, on grade level with, by 2014, you'd probably have your kid out of the school by that afternoon. And so I think what No Child Left Behind aimed to do was challenge what Bush then called the soft bigotry of low expectations that it's okay for us to want that for our kid, but it's not okay for poor, minority, African-American, Hispanic, you know, fill in the blank, kids to want that for their children. So that obviously is where the rub comes. Um, all federal legislation, or nearly all federal, federal legislation, comes up for renewal or reauthorization periodically. This law has been overdue since 2007, and that's another story. I love this cartoon that is sort of about our face, place in the global world. Uh, you know, wah, wah, no child left behind, the bar's too high. Um, and then, uh, you know, with other our competitors around the world, Europe, come on, Tubby, it's not so hard, and Asia, way over the bar. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so No Child Left Behind, how is it working? What is it doing? Um, you know, sometimes I say, in Texas, we would say we're pleased but not satisfied. Uh, we shouldn't be satisfied. I'll talk about where we are. But, you know, we are seeing some encouraging things. One is states have built accountability systems. When Bush was elected, only, you know, a handful of states had what I call real accountability <laughs> systems that had annual measurement and disaggregated data. Most states had snapshot systems where kids were tested once in elementary school, once in middle school, and once in high school. And you didn't really know what happened between elementary school and middle school if there was slippage. So states have created uh, infrastructure where they know a whole lot more about who, what, when, where, and how. That's only good enough if we're taking that information and doing something with it. And parents, of course, have a lot more information about their students. And academics, if I might say, Brian and others, know a whole lot more, and Susan, you all are doing a lot of, a lot of research and uh, public policy explaining now that we have a meaningful data set. The NAEP results, um, you know, we, have, we definitely have seen improvements for our most disadvantaged kids. That's where the focus has been. I'm a big what gets measured gets done fan, and uh, this is not a very good chart, but it, it shows some of, the, some of the gap closing. This is the old test and the new test. Let me get to this one. It's a little easier to see. On the right-hand side of the, of, the, of the diagram are gains made by the purple is black 9-year-olds, the green is black 13-year-olds, red is Hispanic 9-year-olds, and blue is Hispanic 13-year-olds. So you can see it's, um, we've got a long way to go, and there's not, it's not been uniformly uh, uh, successful. Older kids are struggling more. 
Uh, but, you know, we're moving in the right direction. Urban uh, achievement, urban achievement, ur urban gaps have improved, uh, but we have a lot more to do. Today in this country, if you're a minority, you have about a 50% chance of getting out of high school on time. You know, that's scandalous, worrisome. Sometimes I say if half the school lunches served a day and our cafeterias were tainted, we'd be on fire with outrage. But the fact that half of our minority kids aren't getting out of high school on time seems no big deal. So that's what No Child Left Behind is all about. Um, myth busting. You've been to cocktail parties. Looks like most of you have been to cocktail parties. Um, and what do you hear about No Child Left Behind? You hear that it's, you know, narrows the curriculum. That all this focus on reading and math is hurting problem solving or history or you know, arts education, on and on and on. And I think uh, a couple things I would say, and I'll show you a little, uh, some data in a second. We haven't seen any deterioration about, at, in other subject areas. So the NAEP uh, civics exam, we're seeing improvements there as well. So, you know, the thesis behind No Child Left Behind is if you can read and cipher, uh, you're probably going to be able to do better in science and history and other subjects. No Child Left Behind is a floor. It does not say to states, you cannot have assessments in history or social studies or science or whatever. It says you must have them in reading and math. We just don't see the narrowing of the curriculum really show up. Uh, too much testing. This is one you hear a lot. And the federal law requires states to test one time a year in reading and math in a standardized, reliable, kind of valid way. That's what the federal law requires. Now, is it true that school districts and states in, in the march to uh, make progress on those one time a year assessments embed assessment throughout uh, the year? Yes, they do. That's very sound educational pedagogy. But this law requires one assessment in two subjects, one time a year. 2014 as an impossible goal for us to have kids on grade level. We do hear that and we are seeing. We're woefully short of, uh, of meeting that goal. But I would suggest that, you know, if not then, you know, when can we get our, our kids on grade level? And without kind of the power and the prod of a timeline, um, you know, it's, it'll be hard to get there if you don't know where you're going. This over-labeling of, of failing schools as being too punitive to schools, uh, I think is something that you hear a lot as well. The law uses the term of art needs improvement, but the press, I think, often labels schools as failing. So when 50% of the minority kids are getting out of high school on time, I would argue that lots of our schools do need improvement. But, um, you know, you've read a lot about the failing schools, we're punishing schools and so on. Secretary Duncan a few months ago said, you know, if we don't reauthorize No Child Left Behind, 82% of our schools will be failing, labeled failing. The fact of the matter is it's about 50% of the schools that are labeled needing, needing improvement uh, in the final analysis after the data came in. Not wildly overstated in my opinion, but we'll see. Uh, a major decrease in teacher satisfaction. Actually, teacher satisfaction was an all-time high in, in the early days of, of No Child Left Behind. It's at a low right now. You may have seen just a couple weeks ago some teacher data came out. And frankly, I think it's related to some of the pay for performance stuff that's going on around the country, which we'll talk about. But, you know, on its face, assessment and disaggregation really, I don't think, was the culprit. And then the, my, one of my favorites, the focus on low achievers at the expense of our gifted students. The, the Nickleby kids will, as, as they're sometimes called, NCLB, um, will be uh, dominant in our policy debates and that will hurt our gifted learners. We haven't really seen that show up in the data. Here's a slide. You can see that even at the 90th percentile all the way down, we're seeing uh, not, not aggressive, not wildly uh, you know, amazing, but certainly no degradation at the, at the high ends either. So where are we today? Um, I'm worried that reform is in retreat. And, uh, what, that's the wrong thing. Uh, 
that, that the combination of, and frankly, the, the high water mark is what the administration is doing. My successor, Secretary Duncan, uh, in the absence of congressional action, which is, you know, easily put at the feet of both Republicans and Democrats, has had to do something uh, to, to bridge between this long overdue reauthorization, Congress hasn't done their job since 2007, um, and anticipation of a new law. So what the Obama administration has done is they've announced a, a set of waivers. Your waiver is right here. I'll tell you about it. This is it. He's got 26 of these to get through. I'll, I'll get to the part about the Z scores in a second. Um, but, you know, they have laid out some quid pro quos, and there's going to be some litigation around this that says if you do these things, that we in the Obama administration want to see done, common core standards, pay for performance, et cetera, then you're eligible for a waiver. Um, and you know, here are some of the goodies that are, that are out there for you. Uh, 2014 goes away. Uh, targets for high levels of proficiency. Uh, there's a focus only on the lowest performing schools, the bottom 15% of schools, the other 85% of schools in our country are out of the net. Today, every single school in this country feels the power or the pressure, whatever you want to call it, of no child left behind. If you're in Fairfax County, Virginia, or Darien, Connecticut, or Beverly Hills, California, and you have special ed kids or Hispanic kids, you got to worry about them because they're there. Um, this focuses very much on, uh, on low, uh, low achieving and largely urban only uh, school districts. It requires college-ready standards, this common core, we'll talk about that in a bit, and the, the teacher uh, evaluations linked to student achievement. Um, we have had 11 states approved. They are, their names are up there, you'll see, and then 26 more states and the district are, uh, are waiting for their approval. That's your plan. I'll talk about it in a bit. Uh, but basically, we're creating now, instead of a federal you know, platform, a crazy quilt of education policy making, which I'll talk about some of the specifics in a minute, around the federal role. Just last week he said he uh, was, was inclined to consider district level waivers. So Detroit, Chicago, Houston, so again, crazy quilt on top of crazy quilt. And I will say that the Department of Education is going to have a very, very, very difficult time monitoring, enforcing, and understanding what's going on in this crazy quilt. And I'm a little bit worried that it's kind of an, a, plan, a plan to obfuscate uh, and confuse uh, what's going on out there. Um, as for reauthorization, so Arnie's had to do what he had to do, okay, to, to make the engine go. We're still out having school uh, in, in the real world while, you know, while Rome burns and Congress fiddles. Uh, but we have, here's kind of what they're up to. I've just told you about the, what the Obama uh, administration has done. The Senate bill and the House bill are both very similar. Obviously, the, the Democrats are in charge in the Senate. The Republicans are in charge in the, in the House. The good news is we have bipartisanship. The bad news is it's real sorry policy. Um, and what they have done in both cases uh, is focus only, again, on the lowest performers uh, the lowest 5% of schools in, in the Senate, uh, just low performers, you know, to be determined by local school districts in the House version, uh, a retreat from standards, from the, the deadlines, tutoring choice, all of the things that, that go, um, go with that, all under the banner of enhanced local control. So, okay, I want to talk to you a little bit about about the, how, how we're seeing this manifest itself in reality. These are some of the waiver requests, and I'll talk about yours in a second. I'm going to start with New Mexico at the bottom. Their plan just on its face says, all children, baloney on that. We'll, 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 we think we can get 85% uh, in math and 87% in reading, and that's all we aim to do. So if you're in the 15% of Hispanic families or special ed families, just, I mean, I don't know who's going to select wh whether you're in or out, but w we don't aim to educate all children in New Mexico. Minnesota and New Jersey, and this is uh, something very creative, and Massachusetts a little bit likewise, what the, the target now is to, cl to close 
to narrow the achievement gap. So to cut the achievement gap in half, whatever it is, reduce it. Okay, well that's moving in the right direction, but it's far from kind of this aspirational goal of everybody sometime fairly soon. So just reducing gaps uh, is the approach that's, um, that many states are using. Um, let me say a quick word about Michigan, just because it's so confusing, and I don't know, Susan, if you've looked at it at all, but it is a nightmare. Um, what, what, uh, what I loved about it was, the, you know, the, in the, you know, the, the letter, the preamble, the, the, their overarching statement was they aim to uh, get to an achievable level of, uh, uh, of performance for, for kids in, in Michigan. So I guess if it's achievable, they're doing it today. So victory. Um, the, in, 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 in the Michigan waiver, there's something called the Z-score, uh, which is a very complicated uh, formula. Uh, and this is the G store, G, student Z-score is the student scale score minus the statewide average of scale scores over the standard deviation of the scale score. This is the cheat sheet. And then this whole uh, require, this discussion of why we're going to use Z-scores, et cetera. So the idea that most educators or parents could understand this kind of very statistical mumbo-jumbo and what it meant to their kid is, I think, optimistic. Let me get back on my thing. But I want to believe that I did something to the deal, to the... I knew this was going to happen. So which slide do you want? Um, just any one that I can get the thing big and I'll just go for it. Slideshow. Here come. Oh, you did it. You must be one heck of a dean. Let me just say that. <laughs> wow. Okay, so so back to the kind of the, the advertised topic, kind of, you know, this whole kids versus adults. You know, we've talked about all of the kind of policy wonkery, and what is often not discussed very much is, you know, well, what about the students? And, you know, there's loads of blame to go around here. Um, you know, unions, school boards, governance, financing structures all act kind of to, to carry on the existing system. As I said, what I'm most worried about now is, kind of a hide the ball approach, this obfuscation. You know, 26 different state waivers, local district plans, Z scores and reducing achievement gaps and all, just a whole carnival of numbers that, that minority parents in particular, educators not the least of which, and parents are gonna be, uh, you know, very challenged to understand. I also hear a lot these days and, and, you know, usually get a question, which is what I call the blame the parents phenomenon, which is, well, if only the parents would this or that. You know, we can't do our job because the parents aren't doing theirs. And we all know very well that, that parents are challenged and families are challenged, but I think it ends up getting translated as, an, as a way for the system to let itself off the hook. And, you know, I used to say I sent the best kids I had to school, and I know most parents do. So this kind of this constant tension between the role of the parent and the role of the, of the government. And so I sometimes ask, where is the outrage? Spending, just quickly, uh, this is federal spending. You can see it's, you know, way up. Uh, you've seen the achievement, the achievement slope is very, uh, very, you know, slow, slow to flat. This is the federal spending, the stimulus. Obviously, that's not sustainable uh, over the long haul, that giant increase. I will say the, the administration did get a lot of leverage, at least changes in the law, whether this will actually net out into real policy change, time will tell. But um, they did get some good things happening out of the race to the top dollars. Whether they got that much out, uh, whether it was that worth that much money, we'll, we'll find out. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about politics. As I said, you know, everybody's an expert on the topic. Everybody has a perspective. I love that. Um, interestingly, these uh, typical Republican-Democrat policy divisions sh don't show up here. It's like immigration. I spent four years prior to my time in the cabinet working as a domestic policy advisor charged with a more uh, general portfolio of things, labor, transportation, justice issues like immigration, et cetera. 
And so we have this fun and very interesting politics of the unions and the arch conservatives aligned against the civil rights and business communities, which makes it uh, kind of fun. Uh, in the early days, the business and civil rights communities uh, carried the day. Um, I'm concerned about that not being the case now for a, a variety of reasons. Uh, unions, uh, you, you, know, you might think I'm against unions. I'm not. Unions are, are paid to act in the best interest of their members. That's what they do. They do it really well. It's not their job to represent kids. It's their job to represent adults, and they're damn good at it. Um, politicians of all kinds and stripes, my observation after 30 years is they just want the noise levels down. Uh, don't want a bunch of whining superintendents or school board members or you name it. So just keep the noise down. Um, so we've got a couple of constituency, constituencies politically right now. As I said, this whole, and we've heard it a lot on the campaign trail, uh, you know, get rid of the Department of Education. And I guess, you know, intellectually, you could sustain that argument uh, if, you'd if you eliminated all the federal funding. If we truly were going to say we don't mean to have any federal role, but the idea that we'll keep a federal department and spend money but not have any, you know, taxpayer accountability or requirements uh, attached to it seems a little odd in my, in my view. We have kind of the union and Democrat uh, issues of, uh, as I've talked about. So you should see that the first phenomenon shows up on the R side. The second phenomenon shows up on the D side. And then um, parents are all over the board. I'm going to tell my saggy pants phenomenon story. I was in Tennessee last week, and the legislature there just recently uh, debated the saggy pants legislation. You might have re read about it. I mean, it's a thing about basically a dress code that kids have their pants too low to attend school and so on. Of course, the media is all over the saggy pants situation. It's on the front page news, so on and so forth. And my friend, the commissioner there, uh, they, they had a, hear a hearing on the bill, and saggy pants was up first. And then, you know, the, the Tennessee plan to close the achievement gap, their waiver, you know, all of the real meaty issues. Uh, after Saggy Pants got done, you know, every parent and every media outlet in the room left. No one stayed to discuss the gaping achievement gap in Tennessee, but we are all over Saggy Pants. You see uh, parents talk about school lunches, seatbelts on buses, school schedules, et cetera. Not that those are not, you know, important issues. But I think they, the achievement gap deserves at least as much attention. Okay, so what do we do? How do we move forward? Um, as I said, you know, there, there are some, uh, you know, kind of legitimate conservative uh, positions. This is what we tried to, to proffer during uh, the Bush days, is that we ought to have a, a vigorous uh, but discreet federal role and ought to be about taxpayer accountability and whether we truly were meeting this great civil rights goal uh, of educating every, every child. This perennial issue of recalibrating uh, state and federal and local control, the old he who has the gold makes the rules. What role is education as a, as a part of a global knowledge economy? I was a part of the Council on Foreign Relations Task Force that was unveiled last week that my former cabinet colleague Condi Rice and my friend Joel Klein, the former chancellor of the New York schools, uh, were the co-chairs of. And basically the whole frame for that report was we have a national security imperative. We cannot and are not preparing our students to serve in the military. And so that's a national imperative, a national priority. Therefore, we need uh, national policies around it. So the, this ongoing uh, state versus local control. Uh, as I said, what I worry about is while we argue about who's in charge and who gets to decide, you know, our kids are getting lost. So what do we do about it and where do you fit in? Um, you know, obviously, as I've said, and we know this kind of intuitively, sometimes I think we, we know it in a macro level, but we don't necessarily personalize it enough, and that is, you know, our nation and the, our economy and this state and your town and my town you know, we are going to be in a world of hurt if we don't do a much, much, much better job of educating our kids. I've had the opportunity uh, to travel around the world representing our great country and see kind of the appetite, the hunger, the drive, the investment that's, that's going on in China and in India and in Latin America and Africa even about uh, access to education and not only access but quality, to quality in education. And, 
we're debating the niceties of seat belts and stuff while others are starting to kick our butts. Um, obviously, improving education, my former boss used to say that, you know, the best criminal justice reform was a sound education system, the best health care reform, you know, all roads lead to sound educational systems, and I think we know that the things that we've done there really have what are, are what has set us apart as a country in the world. And then, as I said, you know, personalize it to your own kids. What do you want for your child and your grandchild? Do you want, you know, bare minimum grade level achievement by 2014, or do you want your kid performing at least a grade level today? So what can you do about it? I will say that uh, No Child Left Behind gave you a lot more tools, uh, a lot more information that you had prior to that. You can get on your state education department website. You can get on your local school district website and find out you know, how your campuses are doing, uh, the qualification levels of teachers there, uh, you know, subgroup accountability, on and on and on. And I think you know, we've, we're to the point where we can have a more rational debate based on facts and information as opposed to uh, mythology or opinion. Of course, uh, we need to speak up and, and ask our politicians to, to be accountable, uh, expect them to know their business, and, and you know, please don't come to Washington because you'll be so depressed. You might be, be better off uh, talking to your members of your state legislature, but uh, the kind of the knowledge levels of some of both sides of the aisle in Congress is, is kind of frightening. There was a hearing earlier this year where one of the members literally asked, what's a local education uh, uh, agency? i.e., what's a school district? Um, and of course, you can be a, a good role model yourself, a good parent, a good mentor, a good grandparent. I mean, connect personally with, with students that are in your lives um, because, of course, that's where it starts. So I will stop on that somewhat optimistic note. And uh, I hope that what I've said will be enough grist for the mill for some good questions. Yes, sir. I'd like to ask about the other countries that are doing better than we are. I've had the idea in mind, at least from, from my own perspective, that maybe some of that has to do with the fact that we are attempting to achieve equality, whereas the other countries, like the Chinese and the Japanese, are aiming their efforts primarily at the smart kids and letting them get really ahead, which makes them appear to be ahead of us uh, because their brightest are perhaps uh, equal or even brighter than ours. What, what is the difference that has been identified between those countries and what we're doing here? Well, I, a couple things I would say. First, I would not acknowledge, you know, you're right. We, we, in, in the United States of America, we aim to do something that not a lot of places in the world, uh, you know, attempt to do. And that's why we think of ourselves as a great nation that can provide, you know, opportunity for everyone. So. You know, certainly there's an element of truth to what you say. It's also true, and there's a new uh, report out of the, the Bush Institute at SMU, Southern Methodist University, called the Global Report Card, that says that even our best kids, you know, Beverly Hills, you know, whatever, you know, excellent school district you can think about, Highland Park, Dallas, whatever, um, are, are falling short with their peers around the world. So even our most gifted students <coughs> Are, are, uh, are falling short. The other thing I would say is, especially in Asia and India and China in particular, uh, you know, they're gonna beat us at a numbers game, right? So we've gotta do a better job of educating more people to higher levels, because they got a billion people. And um, so we don't have the, if we're gonna you know, continue to lead the world economically, we have to you know, uh, provide more of this uh, across the board. The other thing is, our jobs, and you know this better than anybody here in Michigan, um, most jobs require some level of post-secondary education these days, especially the fastest growing jobs, 16 years of education. Not necessarily a baccalaureate degree, there's all kind of dispute about how much college, but some levels after high school. So if, we, if our labor market needs 16 years of education and we have half of our minority kids not getting out of high school, and many of the kids who do get out of high school completely underprepared for post-secondary work, and we got a long way to go. And so, you know, you're not all wrong, but, you know, that certainly has implications for us, too. Yes, sir, in the back by the door. Um, what do you think of the oncology movement? Say again? The oncology movement? 
I'm not familiar with the on college movement. Uh, un, un -college. Oh, on college. Um, is this this idea that we don't need too many more people with baccalaureate degrees? That it's more like a movement away from you know college is not necessary for success. A lot of people are pursuing jobs with college degrees that don't require college degrees. Yeah, that and and I I mean I think there's some. Uh, validity to some of that. You know, we need more people with 16 years of education, high skill, et cetera, not necessarily a whole lot more people with gender studies or Latin American studies. And I don't mean to pick on you if you're getting a gender studies degree, but or, or an English degree or a whatever. I mean, we need people with high levels of capability in the STEM fields and we're, you know, have big shortages. I think there is an element of truth to that. I also think, however, that when we start to have those kind of talks, you know, guess who it is that's shifted off to shop class or shifted off to tracking systems where you're not college material. And so, you know, we have to be really careful about that, that, you know, skill levels don't get translated as a two-tier system that, you know, affluent people that can, you know, afford to pursue and are set up for success go one route and others go another path. We've tried it before and we are, you know, suffering the consequences. So I'm, I'm worried about that. Yes, sir. I'm concerned about the kind of information our citizens have. And if I think about you as a cabinet person, you're rushing into a meeting, you probably had a very concise, well hopefully decision memo. It wasn't a book. Um, right. And the, I think we need to think about institutions which deliver that kind of concise information to citizens on education. Because it's very difficult for citizens to understand mm -hmm. based on what's out there now. For example, in Michigan, for the last 10 years, expenditures on K-12 education at the state level have had a steady downward trend. And I think as a percent of personal income. And so it's a lower and lower priority. It's been true in the Democratic administration prior to the current Republican administration. It continues. Now, I don't think most people know that simple fact that our policymakers in Michigan uh, over time, it just are putting K through 12 education at a lower and lower priority. I think it's a one-page document. Uh, I think it would be useful for people to know that, and then they can judge. In this day and age, is education smaller or lower? So, have ideas on how we can get citizens concise, well-developed information of the sort you expected that you Well, we know a couple things about how people get information about education. They get it from, from teachers. If you're a, a user of the system, you get a lot of information about, about school from educators. And they get it from a variety of sources, not, you know, sometimes the unions, other teachers, you know, on and on. Um, a couple things I would say to that is, yes, I, I think we need to find ways to convey, you know, what kind of priority, I mean, this is the whole tension between investments on behalf of the elderly and investments on behalf of the young. I mean, that's the next big thing in domestic policy, that and productivity, which I'll say a word about in a second. But I also think that, you know, people who have watched their own household budgets shrink and so forth want to, want confidence from us as educators and us as, as people in government to know that we're doing the, the smartest, most effective things we can do and that we're being as productive as, poli productive as we can with, with resources. And there is a do more with less expectation and attitude these days. And I think one of the things that we're starting to see around the country is a policy area is we fo we focused a lot on infrastructure for, infrastructure for student achievement, testing, et cetera. And the new thing has got to be, you know, how do we use resources on their behalf? 
And if you ask, you remember the school board, I mean, how much does the third grade cost in your district versus the fourth grade? How much is chemistry versus biology? How much is, you know, X program versus Y program? We really don't know very much. We don't know what other enterprises know about how to operate their business. And that's the kind of thing that's, that, that policymakers are starting to demand so that we can figure out, well, can technology solve the science problem or the foreign language problem or whatever? And can we ensure our, our publics that they're getting you know, the biggest bang for their buck? I mean, I agree with you. you know, we are probably under-investing in education these days, but under-investing for what, to what end, and, you know, more, more money is just, you know, we, we, A, we don't have it, and B, we can't make the sell until we engender, I think, greater confidence in our system. That's just my observation. Yes, sir. So it seems from my perspective that the focus on testing is very measurement-based and results-based. I was wondering, could you shed some insight regarding what's being done on a federal level to um, provide uh, constructive um, advice to make strategic like, strategies used by teachers in classrooms more effective to address <coughs> educational problems from more of a root cause and to improve teaching styles and uh, classroom structure. Is there anything being done on a federal level regarding that? Uh, yes, and, and uh, this is one of the, one of the really interesting things that a federal role can and should do. And I'm looking at the woman behind you is an is a important educator named Susan Newman who was party to um, the, that kind of the aftermath of the reading, re the brain research that beget a lot of knowledge about how young children learn how to read. And with that information that frankly came not from the Department of Education but from the National Institutes of Health, uh, we learned a lot about, you know, based in science, based in real research. And it became part of No Child Left Behind, uh, you know, a billion dollar program to help teachers and students learn how to read more effectively. It's gone through many iterations and, and is, is not funded at that level now for a variety of reasons. But it strikes me that that's exactly what the federal government ought to do, is bring to bear, you know, best practices, sound research, and the right tools to help teachers do their work better. And we, frankly, have done a poor job of, of doing that for them. We cannot ask every teacher to be a, you know, a magician and a research scientist in his or her classroom every single day. And there's too much sort of artistry involved when we ought to be deploying a lot more science and research and uh, around these very, very thorny challenges. I mean, it's hard to teach, you know, non-native speakers how to, to speak English and learn to read English and cipher and whatever. That's not something you just, you know, wake up and, and do without some capability and some skill. And um, we need to get much smarter about how we get that research out into the field more rapidly. And we're a long way from doing it. There's a whole institute at the Department of Education. Um, Deborah Ball actually is appointed to the Institute for Education Sciences, whose, sciences whose job is to get that, that information out. But yes, there are things going on in that way. Yes, sir. Well, hypothetically, if uh, they did eliminate the Department of Education, would the state be able to choose whether they continue public education or would they be required to so well, it's a ma most states have it as a matter of their own constitution that they will provide some level of, I mean, most, I guess all of them do, whether it's in their constitution or not, that I can't speak to. But yes, it's a, it's a state, state responsibility. I mean, I guess, theoretically, they'd have the authority to not have school, but uh, in the, in, if you took local control to its farthest uh, end. Yes, sir. Um, so just in like reference to the uh, saggy pants issue and like the comments that you also made as far as um, like if there's tainted school lunches and like the level of excitement or like whatever it was that brought people out. I guess my question is, is um, how do you think you could recreate that excitement or that enthusiasm which really like, I think like to me it seems that people were like affected, it's like a personal right that was taken away right. and that's why they showed up and so yeah. how do you create uh, you know, the perception where like this is your fundamental right where people feel like the fact that I'm not getting a good education is what's, like that's, you know, outrageous as, as 
you know, on par with say paying. Mm -hmm. I think that is, man, you have said that is the sixty-four thousand dollar question, and and one that I would welcome the answer to. We had a little lunch today with some graduate students and talked about just that, just that issue. But how do we get? A, a sense of urgency around this problem, you know, in the in the you know post Sputnik era, we saw you know Russia take us, uh, you know, beat us to, in the space race, and it kind of beget a whole national movement and a you know some some a civic pride around that. Um, I don't know. I mean, gosh, do you? Yeah, no, I mean, what will it take? And I think it's kind of a, you know, not my problem type thing, or people think, you know, it's, you see survey after survey that, you know, my school's good, everybody else's school stinks. And I think, we, you know, frankly, people at all income levels are, are you know, deluding themselves about the quality of their experience often, um, which is not to say there aren't some great schools, but, I mean, I don't know what it's going to take. Maybe it's going to take, you know, China and India, you know, ascending economically for us to say, holy cow. Well, I mean, we might find out. What do you think, Brian? You're the expert. <laughs> you ask my question? Uh, I don't. I will think about the saggy pants. <laughs> <laughs> the saggy pants uh, challenge. But now, I actually want to take the opportunity to uh, uh, have you here to ask you what, kind of looking back on No Child Left Behind and that your experience uh, in the administration, either kind of what would you have changed then, or would you change now? Um, and you were kind of, I made, mm -hmm. you made comments about waivers, and you kind of, some things that were good or bad. Yep. Either things you couldn't have got, couldn't have got uh, then for political reasons, or now, after the lessons of 10 years, you think should be changed. Kind of yeah, no, there, there certainly are, and, and you know, everybody knows this. I mean, legislative bodies pass laws based on what they know then. Duh, just like you, the, the decisions you make in your own life. The reauthorization process is set up for us to say, oh, okay, we've had some experience with this, let's change it. Okay, the fact that we are five years, coming on to six years overdue, you know, of course. I mean, the system is designed to be organic. Um, people often said to me, well, how come, you know, you did this, you know, uh, a system that didn't accommodate growth. Well, the reason we didn't is because no one had annual assessment. You can't do growth from from year to year and without with a snapshot kind of accountability system. So states had to build all of that, and it took many years, five or six years, to get those systems that now allow us to give educators the rightful credit for the progress that they're making along the way. And if we had had that before, we would have done that. Um, I, I will say, and, and I was asked about this at the lunch, you know, the, the highly qualified teacher thing is kind of a mess. It is a mess. Um, and, you know, the, the political uh, equation, I mean, the, George Bush needed one thing out of No Child Left Behind, and that was annual assessment and disaggregated de data and a goal, some consequences. The, the Democrats wanted the highly qualified teacher thing because it was all about raising the profession, driving pay forward, on and on. I mean, certainly, you know, meritorious reasons. But, you know, legislating, obviously, as you know, is the art of compromise. We got accountability, they got the teachers, and there's lots of other stuff in there as well, clearly. But So I think those are a couple things. I think um, the whole role of choice in the statute was, was not well-derived or well-designed. Uh, there were a lot of incentives in the system for it not to be offered in meaningful ways to parents, you know, on and on. So, sure, I'm not one of these, we, we didn't make any mistakes uh, or we didn't learn anything, people, from the law. Certainly there are some things that we would and should do different when we have an authorization, whenever it is. Uh, yes, ma'am, and then we'll ask you again. There's, uh, in education, some kind of, uh, conversations about uh, where uh, U.S. stands in terms of the testing and that we maybe don't do as well in that because it's more, I'm going to say, content oriented and what we do do well and have done in the past and the fact that other countries try to emanate us and are coming in is that creativity, problem solving approach. And what, what do you see about that? Do you see the common standards helping that assessment? I think assessment for multiple choice testing stands in the way of assessing that. How do you, do you have a sense of where we might go and how that might benefit uh, 
education. Yeah, my, well, my hope is obviously that they're not mutually exclusive and they shouldn't be. And that this idea that we're going to have, you know, children who can't read or cipher at very, very basic levels that are wildly creative and innovative is, is you know, kind of a non-starter in, in my mind. So I think we're trying to do both. I think, the cre in my humble opinion, the creativity thing comes less from our schools than the way we think about life and our place in it in this country. Um, we, you know, it's a, it's a meritocracy, we have a lot of freedom, and those are the, the, the values that engender creativity as much as what's going on in the school, in my humble opinion. I don't know if there's been any research on this sort of thing, but, but I think it's, it's the way we Americans approach our world and our life and our, and our you know, our problems. But, you know, again, there are ways we can measure those sorts of things. And, like I said, what, get me what gets measured gets done. If we, want, if we value creativity, let's figure out how to measure it and hold ourselves accountable for doing it. Yes, sir, I said I'd call on you again. Uh, do you think that the role that the federal government has played in education and the government in general has played in education over the past century has been successful? And if so, why, or if not, why? Great question. Mm -hmm. I think it's a mixed bag. Um, I, th I, you know, obviously, I would defend um, this this more muscular role around poor and minority students because it is part of our civil rights framework a as a federal matter. Um, have we done that always and everywhere? Heck no, um, we certainly have not. And so I, I think it's a mixed bag. I mean, the aspirations of the 1965 law were strong, but the strategy was, you know, put the money out and hope for the best. And we, you know, had a flat achievement for a long time. So, I mean, I think as people whine and complain about no child left behind, to me that's a, that's a testament to the fact that it's working to make the system uncomfortable, not uh, an indictment of the failure of the law. I'm a half empty, a half full kind of gal, you know what I mean? <laughs> Don Lynn. Thank you. Uh, we talked about the waivers, and you mentioned that there are 11 states that have received 126 more in process. Uh, almost of equal concern to me to the high school graduation rates is what I will call the state achievement gap. Um, that in this country, the state that you are born into, especially if you're of a lower income and of limited mobility, is going to have as much of an impact on your opportunity in the future as possibly your race or socioeconomic background. And No Child Left Behind allows so much state and local control that we know when you compare state assessment results to the NAEP exam that there are states who are reporting proficiency levels that when that is then compared to NAEP state to state, there are huge variances. I mean, Tennessee is a 60% spread of the number of students proficient according to this Tennessee state exam versus NAEP. Mm -hmm. Massachusetts is actually 10% more than the NAEP exam shows, which is almost a 70 point spread between those two states alone. Mm -hmm. What do you think the federal government, or maybe not the federal government, maybe more regional coalitions can do to reduce this gap? And does the federal government play a role there in ensuring that even if we were at 100% proficiency in each state, you're still not state to state at a uniform level of education for all American students? Uh, okay, well, uh, you know, first I want to brag on No Child Left Behind to say that the reason that you can cite the comparative nature between the NAEP, the education, National Education Report Card, and the Tennessee Standards and the Massachusetts Standards is because we have mandatory participation in our National Education Report Card, which was not the case before No Child Left Behind, an often unknown and unheralded part of the law. So the thinking behind that was that people like you or the great people of the state of Tennessee could say, holy cow, we're way down here with, you know, whatever, and would do something about it. And I think back to this, you know, calibration and recalibration of the federal role. They're paying 90% of the, of the load, you know, should they know their system stinks and have the opportunity to do something about it? Well, sort of didn't really work that way, did it? Um, so. Uh, Fast forward to the Common Core, the so-called voluntary Common Core, so voluntary that you can't get a waiver without doing it. So is it really voluntary? There's going to be lawsuits probably, you know, another thorny, uh, thorny, you know, federal versus state kind of policy. And so efforts like that, whether they're regional or national, surely can, you know, raise the bar and provide more truth in advertising. 
My only beef about the Common Core, and I don't think it's you know going to do mind control or anything like that that some people are worried about, um, is that we have, I said this at lunch, we have 50 speedometers that say we're going too slow. 50 state accountability systems that say we're going too slow. So we're going to get a new speedometer. But what about speeding up? What about the closing the achievement gap? We are so woefully short of meeting the pitiful Tennessee standards, it's not even funny. But we're going to raise the bar and put it way up here. Go Tennessee. What about speeding? You know, see what I'm saying? And, and, and I know, having worked on behalf of school boards and in state legislatures and with state boards of education, that by the time the system grinds through the teacher training, the new books, the new assessment systems, the professional development, all the things that have to go into understanding the new speedometer, we're not going to do very much speeding up in the meantime. Yes, ma'am. Um, so as far as I realize that this is uh, the No Child Left Behind Act is to instill in younger children, um, but have you ever have has it ever been considered what you know we're prepping them for to graduate and um, go to college? Has it ever been considered that you know coming where they come from they may not be able to afford college and. Um, we know that student loan debt is currently a problem in the United States with the failing economy. So how has it ever been discussed um, tying in some, some type of you know, student loan plan or capping interest rates for um, federal loans or anything like that? Yeah, all of those policies get discussed. They're not really discussed in the context of, of K-12 education except to the following, that you know we think that before kids can be successful whether they can afford it not that notwithstanding and higher education is to make sure they can read and do math on grade levels so that's kind of what the the policy issue is before us sure there are lots of things that we can do differently and better and there's you know tension around this too of course in higher ed um, i had you know a, a whole commission called the commission on the future of higher education uh, associated with that that Sue Donarski uh, worked with on financing systems and how to simplify and, and do some things much in much smarter ways but you know in a nutshell you know we have access problems that means kids can't get into it and kids don't complete well enough because they didn't work well enough prepared see no child left behind accountability issues very little transparency very little understanding about what what magic is going on here at the University of Michigan or at the Macomb Community College or whatever. Is Macomb here or Chicago? Here, here. okay. I get them mixed up. Uh, there's a lot of them or, or you know, any state that, that, you know, consumers really don't have very much information about, you know, the value, if you will. And all this sort of talk is just heresy, so I'm glad I'm saying it towards the end of my presentation because I'll probably get run out of town. And then, of course, the, the issues you talk about affordability. And there's a lot of alignment between those three things. We're way, uh, you know, Sue and I talked about it earlier today, you know, we haven't gotten to kind of the nation at risk era in higher education. People don't understand it. People aren't going, holy cow, this is an outrage. But we're getting there. Yes? Um, so you talked about some of the myths that come up with no child left behind. And one of the things that I've heard is that teachers are now so focused on teaching to the test um, because they feel like they have to meet these certain standards. I know we've had teachers um, in Michigan who have been accused of cheating on these tests because they feel so much pressure. Um, so I guess I want to know your thoughts on that. And if you think that is a cause for concern, what we could do to help alleviate that pressure? Like, yes, we have to have a certain kind of measurement, but how do we prohibit teachers or encourage teachers to not just teach the test, but have that be incorporated in their overall curriculum? Okay, so um, that's a, there's a lot of angles yeah. on that thing. So starting with teaching to the test, is there anything wrong with that? If you, if you have a curriculum, whether it's the Common Core or otherwise, that says this is what we expect students to know, and you have an assessment that is aligned to that and measures that, great. Teach to the test every day, all day, okay? 
And, and that's the, the whole idea of it. So there's nothing necessarily inherently wrong with teaching to the test. Uh, when it begets, you know, cheating, obviously we're not for cheating. No one's for cheating, at least of all by our, our teachers. And, and obviously, you know, it's very few isolated examples of teachers who cheat. I mean, just like there are, God willing, you know, isolated examples of doctors that cheat and lawyers that cheat and, you know, bankers that cheat and on and on. And we ought to call it out. Well, maybe there's a few more of them. <laughs> Uh, we ought to call it out and, and you know, be mad about it because it discredits the, position, the profession, of course. Um, with respect to what can we do about it, what we're going to see in the future, obviously, are assessments that are more embedded within technologically offered curricula that's more, uh, 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 you, uh, not, more opaque, if you will, to the student and to the teacher. So this assessment's going on as part of the, the enterprise more frequent and lower stakes, if you will, and can be corrected along the way. I mean, the thing about high stakes testing is that it's, you know, an event, and, and you kind of, you know, can't have your cake and eat it too either. You're doing too much testing or it's too high stakes. You know, pick your poison. So, you know, there's some, there's some uh, common sense in there somewhere, and I think technology is going to find the way to solve some of it. Yes, sir. You've been very patient back there. Picking up on your title, uh, kids versus adults, I think we can look back at least a century and see that that's been an issue that's gone back and forth. It was right after World War I that there was a recognition that a third of the nation's young men flunked the test for the draft. And that was perceived as a crisis at that time. And a lot of things happened. The National Research Council in 1923 or 4 set up the Children's Committee which tried to look for solutions and a lot of things happened in the 20s and 30s for that. Most of the funding wasn't federal. Somebody's asked about federal. It came from philanthropy uh, primarily. Um, a lot of things happened during the Depression that really helped children, families, schooling and so forth. A lot of that was lost during World War II but then there was a big renewal of things after World War II, as we all know. And some people would say that was sort of the golden era of education, the beginning of federal funds for higher education, mm -hmm. so forth and yeah, so yeah. on. But I think it's important that we don't just focus now and we sort of look back. Well, things were sort of okay then and these are recent problems because at least for the U.S., it's at least a century old. You are so right. And I, I used to, you know, use a quote from that, the work in the early, you know, the 20s. And basically it was the same discussion we're having now, whether we can or should or need to leave children behind. And what curriculum, it's all, you know, nothing is new under the sun, as they say. But you're absolutely right. A historian in the group. Yes, sir. You mentioned some of the entrepreneurial efforts by states um, earlier in your presentation during the 90s. I was wondering, what you thought about the public school choice movement and other sort of choice and things going on and how those interact with No Child Left Behind and where, where you see opportunities or challenges there? Uh, choice is not really set up, uh, you know, the financing of education, let me put it this way, the financing of education does not really set up a system where the federal government can or should be the primary actor in, in choice options. So, you know, we used to talk about it because obviously on the Republican side of the aisle there are a lot of people who are interested in this, you know, whether we could, you know, do some things from Washington. But when 90 percent of the money is coming from state and local governments, you know, it's hard to, for me to sit up in Washington, D.C. and compel you to spend those resources to go from school district A to school district B. And so it's, you know, it, it, it doesn't really work very well. Now, in the District of Columbia, uh, the, the DC scholarship program or state or local efforts like, the, like there are a few of around the country like Minnesota. I mean, I think it's, it's kind of a mixed bag of, of, uh, of results, honestly. DC has, I think, some things to commend it and, you know, I would support it again. Um, but, it, it, you know, I, I think it's been, you know, sort of a mixed, mixed bag. On the public school choice stuff, it didn't really work very well as part of No Child Left Behind for a couple of reasons. One, there weren't better performing public schools for those kids who were trapped in the schools that need, needed improvement to get to. 
It often didn't carry transport, transportation. So it was kind of a dead letter as a, as a matter of policy. I'm just saying, you know. And what is more, districts had no motivation, why would they, to advertise to parents that when your child was in a so-called failing school, a school that needed improvement, that those parents had access to Title I dollars for tutoring or the option to go to another school. Why would they want to fool with all that? So, you know, poor and minority students, you know, often didn't realize they had those options. And consequently, the take-up rates, uh, even the, the thousands of people who were eligible, is, you know, minuscule. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, I, you mentioned uh, teacher quality a few times, and I was wondering um, what you thought were some ways that at the federal level that we could improve teacher quality or improve teacher training um, currently. Well, what I think we need to do is invite a lot more people into the profession. We need to expand the pool of people that we will, would consider for teaching. And just as we could not run higher education in America without adjuncts, people who are, are you know, members of a profession that come one semester or teach in the afternoon only, or this idea that there's only one way you can come and be, uh, you know, offer talent into our schools is if you want to work 185 days and, you know, all day every day, you know, under these conditions, and even though it doesn't really work out this way, you know, think of it as a lifelong career is erroneous. We don't run anything like that. You know, I'm a senior advisor to a management consulting company. They call me when they need me, they, you know, so on. And we have to just make our pool bigger, for starters. The other thing we need to do is, you know, be welcome and open to a variety of providers, whether they're teacher colleges, Teach for America, local service centers, for-profit institutions, you name it. They can provide that secret sauce that makes a great teacher a teacher, and let's figure out how we're going to measure whether those people can be successful in front of young people and go to it. But we need to you know, make, the, make the, the pool bigger by welcoming people part-time, subject area, career changers, et cetera, and make it much quicker to get in and out of. Yes, sir? Um, along similar lines to the previous question, to what extent do you think that the problem is that we have the wrong people teaching versus that the people we're teaching aren't doing well enough versus that it's more a matter of having students uh, put in better effort or something along those lines? Probably all of the above. Well, first of all, teaching is hard and gotten harder. Expectations are higher. The, the, the populations are more challenging. The research base is thin and we haven't armed even our best people with good information about how to be successful and on and on and on. Uh, it's also true that we're not recruiting our best and brightest often into the profession. No, no, that ain't the case at the University of Michigan. But, um, but I think on the whole and in the main, we see that, you know, teacher candidates are from, you know, the, the bottom quartile of, you know, our young people. So uh, that's the second thing. The third thing is, it is a, we grossly misallocate uh, our human capital in this enterprise. If you are, have a lot of experience and a PhD, you are teaching at Cream Puff High. Three AP classes at Cream Puff High. If you are brand new and challenged and no, very little experience, you're going to the most challenging educational setting in this country until you wash out. That's how we do it. So I think we might want to, you know, think about ways we can do the other. And of course, that's all. That's those are union contracts. That's tenure. That's the way it works. If you stay long enough, you. It's like being an airline attendant. You know, a flight attendant, whatever they call them now. I see enough of them, you'd think I'd know. Uh, let's see, yes, sir. Uh, you've mentioned this, but also I was hoping you could elaborate a little bit more on um, what you think the appropriateness and prospect for something even approaching this form of accountability in higher ed. <laughs> okay, well, no one's gonna tell on me, are you? <laughs> um, well, of course, I don't think we should have no child left behind like accountability in the sense that we're going to, you know, test every child and disaggregate, and it's obviously a more complicated enterprise, et cetera. 
period. However, I do think there are some things that we can do that will give the public, give our consumer far greater information about what they're getting, how affordable it is, and what their prospects for success are. And there are some, you know, fledgling efforts going on in that regard. The collegiate learning assessment is one. The voluntary school accountability system is one of, sort of, but they're not very comparable. I mean, it's kind of hide the ball. So we can go a lot further than we're going now. And, you know, as if higher education in America is so great as we love to think, and I think it is too, what are we afraid of? Um, and I think we owe our publics that. And I think, you know, resources are not going to continue to come. And, you know, there's, you know, you all know all this. It's, you know, affordability is a huge, huge issue. And people think, well, I, you know, the, your kid's coming home to live with you after a quarter million dollar investment? I hope nine's not. I'm going to say that. She's a sophomore. <laughs> Alex. Uh, in the efforts to improve teacher quality, to what extent should um, assessments of teachers be based in test scores versus other means of, of assessing teachers? Okay, that's a great question. Did you hear? But what? How much should student achievement be part of teacher evaluation? Okay, this is. You might be surprised to hear me say this. So. The Teacher Incentive Fund was created in the Bush administration. It was a $50 million program. It was a pilot program. We had about 20 projects around the country in uh, right-to-work states and union environments, uh, you know, campus-based, individual-based reward systems all over the board to try to start to test this theory that we have no experience with. Fast forward, you know, five or seven years, it's now like a $500 million program and states all over the place are, you know, leaping into this. Now, might it be the cure for cancer? It might be. I don't think we know that yet. And I don't think we have built, you know, the kind of infrastructure and the kind of systems that are going to support it yet. My observation in working with local school boards and school districts is that we have not done even the most basic kind of things on human capital management that you would find. Under, well understood uh, evaluation systems, well trained managers, frequent feedback, you know, all the sorts of, you know, management 101 that you'd get at the business school around here. We don't have that in education. So we're going to go from almost nothing to, you know, PhD level ties between outputs, student achievement, and, and personnel management. And this, frankly, as I said, is why I think teachers are so like, what the hell? Now this, you know, and, and may, as I said, I, I hope that it will net some good things, but I don't think we're ready to leap headlong there yet. I think this is our last question. Okay, last question. Then I was introduced one time after our last speaker, that was me, free margaritas will be served in the lobby. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I, I hate to ask a downer last question, but um, it's said, and maybe I'm simply wrong, but that in education, as in healthcare, by the way, the United States spends more per pupil than any other industrialized country. And we seem to get less bang for our buck. One, is that true? And two, if it's true, why? It's true. And the why is because we can afford the luxuries and the niceties of debates like class size and benefit levels and school quality and technology and curriculum levels and advanced placement programs and gifted and talented and on and on and on. And these are luxury items around the world, if you will. You know, as I said, you know, in, in the developing world and most of the parts of the world, it's all about 80 kids crammed in, you know, dying of hunger for knowledge, killing themselves to, to get to some level of attainment. And so I think, you know, we're rich enough to be able to afford to spend time and money on some of those issues. And that must be right because Sue Donarski's shaking her head, yes. Yeah, so <laughs> with that down or closing note, I will thank you for your good attention and thank you for having me.